Um, I was in Queenpin. There's a gentleman that has to be offed. And you could have just done it neatly and quickly and had him fall and whimper in the corner. But no, it becomes this bloodbath, gory mess with the women <laughs> really, really going over the top in the killing scene. Issues? Uh, where, 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 what's this coming from? I have a lot of repressed rage. <laughs> no, um, you know, um, I would say that was the hard, one of the hardest scenes I've ever written. There's a scene bury me deep that was it just as hard. Um, um, but um, I had created this main character, the, um, the queen pin, who was so controlled and so self-disciplined and almost seems almost robotic in the first part of the book that you feel you know that she is she is really this sort of cold coiled machine that when this this crime occurs that you were going to have to see the mask come off so that it had to be very over the top for that to work for you to really see that this was um, in, her, in this case, there, it needs to happen, but it's also a crime of passion in other ways. That there was something, you know, there was, so it was, it was for the character. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it seemed important that, that she really sort of show us, um, you know, the, the, what, was, what lie beneath somehow. So it had to be very violent that way. And it was also a little bit ripped off in part from... Um, the book is a very inspired in part structurally by Goodfellas, which is one of my favorite movies. And there's that notion of the the naive person coming along, being schooled in the way of life of crime. And there's a moment, there's a few moments in Goodfellas, but there's one in particular when he really sees what he's gotten himself into and the shock to, to him and to us as the viewer. And I, I wanted the, the narrator in this case to have that sense of shock. Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? So it was for the art. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to go back and watch Goodfellas now. Uh, well, it's, all, it's never a mistake. <laughs> Any other questions at the point? Yes, sir. How much time do you spend uh, researching your uh, work before you actually start writing mm -hmm. and then as you go along do you have to go back and maybe do a little more research here and there um, I, I do a lot a lot of re research usually I usually take a year and a half um, to write the book and I'm doing research usually about a year of that um, at a certain point I have to stop um, or I would never write the book. <laughs> um, at a certain point, I have to stop because I'm realizing I, I'm in the danger of flooding the book with research rather than story. Um, and I, I, and that, that's the point which I sort of will put it aside. And then I'll return to it if I need to check, but I'll try to avoid it. And it ha you know, I, now I'm writing a book set in contemporary. Um, and I thought that this would go faster and I would avoid it. Um, but I have found that I just like to, it's about cheerleaders and now I have, I know everything about <laughs> cheerleading and I watch YouTube around the clock to watch, it's a, it's a stark weird novel about cheerleaders, but I, you know, I have found myself, I, I cannot look at YouTube anymore, I have to turn it off. So I, I think at heart I'm a, um, I'm a research junkie. So that is, that is the, um, the, da the procrastination danger for me. There's a lot on YouTube about cheerleaders, by the way. <laughs> Some oh, stuff don't you don't want to see, I bet you do. <laughs> um, what I found interesting when I, when I went back to read your dissertation was uh, you were talking about um, the, the, the protagonist as the other. Um, and when I, when I think about noir, a lot of time what I'm thinking about is the society is the norm, and he as the other being the, the person that's transgressing, breaking those uh, the laws or going over the line. But what you laid out in the book is that him being the other was actually subversive at the time to the, the political climate of the 1950s. 
Right, yeah, there's, a, it's a, there's this weird flip, I think, that occurs in, in noir. You know, you have, in the classic noir, you have, you know, this, this tough, this white guy at the center. You know, he's either the PI or he's, in the case of, say, James Cain, he's sort of the, the criminal, the guy who's going to get in over his head, the patsy, the sap, you know. But so he's, he's sort of seemingly in, in the culture in a position of power. Mm -hmm. He's white. He's a man. He's usually middle middle class, maybe you know, maybe maybe working class. But he should be the guy who's in, in control and power. But he's not because he's either a slave to some, his emotions, which he can't control, his desire, which he can't control, or he's put in um, put in a world that's presented as frightening or menacing. Like the PI, you know, everybody is against him. Everyone's going to double cross him. Everyone is duplicitous. He's the only one you can count on. So he really becomes the he feels like he's the endangered person. He's the one under siege. He's the minority. Every you know, every you know, he has. He's the one without the power. Which is the universal feeling that we were talking about before. Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And so I think that's the sort of idea that these are. Um, which you'll hear a lot, and which I heard when I when I wanted to write my dissertation on this, is that you know these books are they're racist, they're, they're misogynist, they're you know et cetera, et cetera. But of course, they're so much more complicated than that because these are you know these are movies that are actually about about powerlessness, about feeling different, feeling other, feeling besieged, um, and that that is a sort of universal fear, I think. And this was a, a the the fact that. As I remember it, the, the way that they did not conform to society's norms became um, a threat to the, the, the McCarthyism of the era, in that they wanted people to be very sort of straight laced. Right, and, and a company man, and be a, yes. I mean, when you get into the 50s, I just say, you know, nuclear family, you know, the rise of the nuclear family, but this guy's a loner, and he never gets married, he never has kids, so he can't be a part of that. He's not a company man, he doesn't, he, you know, usually the PI, you know, as we were talking about before, get, got fired from the DA's office or fired from the police force. He can't hold down a job, he can only work for himself. He's not a company man, he, you know, he can't abide by the party line. And there's the sort of even more delicate notion that um, that couldn't be discussed, which is that he, of course, really is excited by otherness, and he's really des desirous of it, and he wants the bad thing, the other thing, the, the dark thing, um, and that's not acceptable either. So, um, you know, that's one of the arguments that's been made about why noir ends in the late 50s. It has reached, it has sort of reached there, there was no place for this guy at all anymore, mm. you know, and so it's the cycle had to end. Of course, it didn't end because we, <laughs> we still want it, but <laughs> it got repurposed into other things. Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> yes.